Okay, well, good afternoon again. So my name is Alicia Snetti. I'm an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico. I'm currently a public health um, project coordinator here at the National Indian Health Board. And I'll let um, Liv introduce herself. Hi, my name is Liv. I use she and they pronouns. I am a public health associate um, working with our maternal health team at the National Indian Health Board. All right, okay, and you can go on the next slide. Okay, so with our maternal health projects at the National Indian Health Board, we are located under the public health policy and programs PHPP team. And our vision statement that we came up together as um, a team is working together to empower sovereign tribal nations to improve equity policy and public health systems that build thriving native communities now and for the next seven generations. And I think that mission statement really just grounds all the work that we're doing together as a team, whether we're addressing work in environmental health, maternal health, behavioral health. So um, I also support our behavioral health projects and always just want to emphasize that we're here as a resource and always looking forward to making new connections and um, addressing Native health together in Indian country. So go ahead. Next slide, Liv. Okay. So with this uh, maternal health tribal learning community series, um, it really was developed to create a space and a platform to just encourage connections and a space to learn from each other. You know, we're all doing this work in different um, ways and different backgrounds, coming from different communities or um, educational backgrounds, experiences, and just want to continue to uplift the voices and the communities um, and people that are doing this work in addressing maternal and child health. Um, and it is in partnership with our CDC partners, specifically with our Hear Her campaign project team and the Maternal Mortality Review Community team, um, MMRC for short. So you'll see that acronym um, throughout. But with our Hear Her campaign, the overall goal is to amplify the voices of American Indian and Alaska Native people. And we work to improve maternal health outcomes by raising awareness of urgent maternal health warning signs. And towards the end, you'll see that we'll be going through the different resources that are available on the CDC he, her webpage. And with our MMRC project goal, we're currently exploring the feasibility and implementation approaches of tribally led MMRCs, um, which overall work to strengthen the foundations of tribal sovereignty and self-governance. And we'll also be sharing um, those resources, resources at the end of the presentation. And then I'll hand it to Liv to just go over some ground rules throughout this series and some reminders. And then I'll pick it up I'm going over the agenda. Thanks, Alicia. Um, so as you might know, this is really meant to be a community space and a space for all of you to also get to connect with one another and share and partner in all of the amazing work that you're doing. Um, and so we will be going into breakout rooms at one point. So we just wanted to share some ground rules of remaining curious and um, not making assumptions to pause and listen first, um, to know that while we do expect um, effort, we don't expect perfection from one another. And we really are here also to build community and connect with each other. And we're really glad everyone's here and that we get to share this space together. Okay, thank you, Liv. So reminders, um, we also wanna point out that, you know, this is a heavy and personal topic. So we do encourage <laughs> you to step away if you may need to um, also, some quick reminders that we will be sharing today's recording via a post webinar email and also we'll be um, sending out the links um, we're just highlighting that on our NIHB maternal health webpage. but most importantly everyone who registered for this presentation you'll have access to the slides and recording and that um, everything should be will be sent um, within one week post event so yes and next on the agenda again we'll just be we're looking forward to and so honored to have the Alaska Native Birth Workers community, Margaret and Abra here with us today to share the amazing work that they're doing and just 
um, listening more about the resources, the knowledge and experiences um, from them. So I'm very happy to have them here with us today. After the presentation, we'll be moving on to breakout sessions and I'll be explaining more about what that entails and what um, platform we'll be using for that um, after their presentation. And then we'll go um, around and see if anyone has questions, follow up questions, and then I'll walk us through the different maternal health resources um, during the presentation, but also we'll be highlighting, highlighting those um, in a post webinar email. And then I'll hand it off to um, Avra and Margaret to introduce themselves. And then once that's done, we'll let them share their presentation slides. So thank you everyone. Awesome, Koyanukpak, Alicia, and Liv, and everyone. I'm so happy to see you all here today. Uvanga Nungasu, Kutkiaga Vig Mugurunga, Patkatat Kuyagarunga. My Nupiak name is Nungasuk, and I'm from the Patkatuk family from Utkiagavik. Um, I'm a Nupiak, and I live here in Dagayakuk, also known as Anchorage on Denina lands. That's where I'm zooming in from. And I'm really grateful and excited to be here today and to see some names I recognize. Uh, hi, hi. Some folks who are saying hi in the chat. So good to be here. I'm excited to share. And I'll turn it over to Margaret for your introduction. Um, I said my Danaka name is Kiido Dauno, and um, I am from the interior village of Ruby on the Yukon River, and I'm grateful to have been able to grow up kind of in different rural communities throughout Alaska, and now live on Denina lands in Tagayakak, as Opera mentioned um, as well, um, where I along with my partner and raising four children who were born at home. We had a preterm baby at the Alaska Native Medical Center here, which we'll be talking about um, that place, and then a birth center, and then again at home. And I am honored to be able to work as a midwife. I'm a midwife at the Alaska Native Medical Center, kind of like half time, and then now also get to do um, this work with Alaska Native Birth Workers community about half time. And I came uh, to midwifery through community health work. So before um, my clinical practice, I worked in um, rural and indigenous community health for, for a long time. Really honored and grateful to be here with you all. Basi, I'm feeling nervous with like the number of registrants that were mentioned and it's really helping to see some like familiar names say hi. So Basi. I'll share my screen and get it into presenter mode. Okay. So as we shared, um, we're both from Alaska Native Birth Workers Community and this presentation, we're calling it Sovereignty from First Breath. And uh, Margaret and I are here together. We do have more team members we'll introduce later on as well that um, aren't here. So a little bit about who we are. We are a community-based group of full spectrum indigenous birth helpers and reproductive justice advocates. And our goal was to just um, gather, organize and be there for Alaska Native families and support them on their uh, pre Alaska Native and other Indigenous families to support them on their preconception through postpartum journey with culturally matched care. And this is a picture of the six of us in, in the snow a couple uh, springs ago, um, the six of us co-founders um, that started Alaska Native birth workers together. And a little bit about how we came together. This is an image from 2017 of Indigenous midwives in Alaska. And this is at the hospital that Margaret mentioned, Alaska Native Medical Center. And um, this gathering was so special. And it was actually happening at the same time that I was hosting the very first Indigenous lactation consultant training that Cami 
um, Cami J. Goldhammer and Kimberly Morisalis. Um, they, ha they have that. I'm sure many of you know them or and have attended. So I was um, hosting that in Utkeagovic and I missed out on this gathering, but it was a really wonderful time um, when people were all these midwives were gathered and birth workers in Anchorage and thinking about how we can support our families in um, the journey and how important it is to meet the need, especially in Alaska where families are traveling really far from um, flying in from rural Alaska to give birth in Anchorage, often alone and not supported. And Margaret um, also initially wanted to start a doula org through ANTHC, which is another part of our tribal healthcare system, but then understood quickly that we needed to do that from the community. And so then um, had a community led um, movement instead and not a part of our healthcare system, but through community. And our vision is that our communities are reconnected to birth through reclamation of ancestral knowledge and exercising sovereignty from birth. Our mission is to serve Alaska Native birthing families so they feel supported, well cared for, and full of the information they need to make confident choices around reproductive health, birthing, and parenthood. And we do this in order to reclaim as well as create new ceremony to heal our ancestors, ourselves, and future generations who have been harmed. And our values are responsibility to community, culturally matched care, connection to land and waters, and upholding ceremony and cultural teachings. And then a little about what we do. This is when I turn it over to you, right, Mo? Okay. Yeah, so as Abra mentioned, we came together as volunteers to um, try to address like this gap in support of mainly like rural birthing people that are um, that come into Anchorage um, apart from their families and support systems for birth. Um, so we started out as volunteers just kind of like filling in as by request um, as support people um, for people during labor and birth. And as our work and our group has grown, we've kind of developed like three rings of service. So that first inner ring is, um, you know, direct support to um, native birthing families. So um, supporting them like one-on-one -on -one support by request during pregnancy or like preconception, pregnancy, during labor and birth, postpartum, um, early parenting. Um, we also um, provide direct support in the form of like childbirth prep retreats or classes, um, traditional knowledge um, sharing events, um, we've done some different craft classes for um, celebrating our arts. Um, and then the next ring out is growing our statewide network of trained Native birth workers. So growing our circle, bringing more people back into this support role and hopefully um, expanding out to, you know, like every community in Alaska, um, reconnecting this role, um, support role for birthing families. And then kind of the third ring out is, um, you know, doing our best to collaborate with partners for systemic change to better support Native and rural birthing families. So some of the events that we've been able to host over the last few years, um, we have this online kind of drop-in visiting circle space that really started during the pandemic when everything, you know, turned to Zoom. And so this has been going on for like over three years now. Um, every other Saturday morning, we just open up, you know, a Zoom room for families to come in and visit. And we always have one of our birth helpers that are helping to like host that space. And it's really just open to whatever topics come up in the discussion. And there's been some really beautiful sharing in those spaces um, to help keep us connected, um, especially when we were apart physically. Um, as I mentioned, um, been able to host some traditional arts and craft workshops, um, traditional 
knowledge, virtual, virtual sharing circles. Like yesterday, we were honored to host a Klinka elder to share stories about a birthing tree that was so beautiful. And that recording now is on our um, Facebook page. Um, we're grateful for our community members um, supporting this work and sharing that their knowledge. Um, the childbirth preparation retreats. And then the next slide has some pictures from the different birth worker trainings we've been able to host over the last few years. So we hosted Zagito and Melissa Brown and Candice Newman from um, Canada um, to um, facilitate their full spectrum Indigenous doula training. Um, we hosted Cami and Kim um, up here for Indigenous breastfeeding counselor training. Um, just this past fall, we hosted Center for Indigenous Midwifery, Rhonda, Grantham, and team to um, facilitate the Indigenous Childbirth Educator training. Um, we have um, kind of uh, regular like sharing um, circles and skill shares to continue connecting. Uh, building connection and um, skills for our local Indigenous birth workers. Um, so over the past few years, we've, I don't, I don't have the number in my head, how many people have attended our trainings, but part of the agreement when they come to these trainings that we've fundraised for to be able to offer to our community at no like financial cost to them um, with the agreement that they'll pay it forward by serving another native birthing family. So that's kind of how we're able to um, continue this work forward too. This slide um, is so awesome to me. Our growing team, we started with you know a few volunteers and over the years um, in gratitude to like many of our supporters and funders are now able to pay um, birth workers to do this as like their full-time day job. It's no longer, you know, something that we're volunteering for on the side of our full-time, our other like full-time day jobs and family and community obligations. It's um, really exciting. <laughs> so Abra will talk a little bit about Birth helpers. Yeah, thanks, Mo. So, um, birth helpers, birth workers, there's different terms. And then we have terms in our native, various native languages as well. So, birth helper is someone who provides continuous physical, emotional, spiritual, and informational support for a birthing person before, during, and after childbirth, and also for the full spectrum or full circle of reproductive health experiences. So we're there for whatever families might need, whatever they're going through, um, whether it's loss or family planning or preconception. Um, and we're also, um, we talked briefly, or we talked about like reclaiming ceremonies too and how important that is. And what we do is we'll share information and resources to help families prepare and we'll provide one-to-one -one support during labor. We'll be that continuous supportive presence and we'll help create comfortable environments, providing re reassurance. Um, and what we'll help with uh, breastfeeding, postpartum support. We do not make any decisions for the birthing person. We don't perform any clinical tasks and we don't have access to anyone's private healthcare information. And a little bit more about full spectrum work too, in addition to the prenatal labor, postpartum support, um, we'll be there for people who are um, trying to become pregnant during miscarriage, abortion, fetal or infant loss for adoption, while accessing care as LGBT, LGBTQT, two-spirit plus people, and during other rites of passage, like I mentioned. And we're not like specifically trained in any of those areas, but we'll be there for you and we'll hold space. And some of the benefits of having a birth support um, person is that you will likely be more likely to have a spontaneous vaginal birth, more likely to have a shorter labor, less likely to have a cesarean birth, less likely to use pain medication and more likely to have positive feelings about the childbirth experience. So having that like birth support is um, proven to be really important. And I love this image of um, 
Margaret in the birth tub and um, her sister Lena supporting her. It's just so special. And then a little bit about how to request A and B C support. Um, and this is if you right now we're in Alaska and we offer support in Alaska and we do mostly offer support in Anchorage. And so that's what like we talked about growing our network. We hope to expand across Alaska and have more support. But um, for people who are wanting support while they're pregnant, we call it matched birth support before labor begins. And you can get on our website, we'll share that at the end too, and go to services. And then um, there's a request form there that people can fill out to request support. And that's also where you can find information about our um, events, like our childbirth preparation retreat. And the other thing, the ANMC is a big hospital, um, and we'll talk more about that later, but around 1600 um, native babies are born at that hospital every year. So a lot of times parents will show up, they might get medevaced and they might be all alone. So the um, healthcare providers know about our organization and they can call us for on-call support. So we have a phone that is um, 24 seven monitored call phone. And if they, um, so like if a nurse or midwife um, determines that someone might need extra support, they can call one of us doulas and then we can head to the hospital and join them. And we also go to birth center births and home births. So um, we're able to meet people kind of where they're at right now, which has been really special. And next, I think, um, Mo, you'll talk a little bit about the context and perspective of mm -hmm. rural and indigenous burning people in Alaska. Yeah, so we just wanted to briefly share a little bit about um, how ANBC came together and how this, um, you know, what our work focuses on. And there's a lot on our website, too, um, that kind of explains a lot of things, too. And then this next um, chunk of slides is a little bit more about our understanding of, you know, kind of the current like situation for rural and indigenous birthing people in Alaska, as far as we understand it. Um, also, you know, noting that, you know, those of us um, carrying out this work right now, primarily are located in Anchorage. So we're in our, um, like our main hub for the state where a lot of our services are. And I, you know, as a birthing person, um, gave birth here with the resources available here. So I, I, I don't know what it's like as a rural birthing person. So we're not um, trying to say what that's like, but this is kind of like a big picture view of, um, you know, what we've been reading about, hearing about, learning about um, over the last few years to help guide our work. Um, so if we go back to the birthright slide, um, you know, kind of the like base for why we're here and the title of our presentation is we really see this as our, our birthright. We envision sovereignty for Alaska Native people from our first breaths on earth through the reclamation of our power during rites of passage. Um, that are rooted in ancestral knowledge and that each birthing person is surrounded by their community and connection to their sacred lands and waters. Um, so again, I'm just really thinking about the birthing tree story that we heard yesterday and how, um, how sacred of a time pregnancy and birth are and how our communities um, viewed that, you know, as a, our original ceremony and supported that. And then just thinking about kind of like how birth is taking place um, in a lot of places now, kind of more medicalized in the hospital, even normal healthy births. Um, so for us, like merely surviving birth is not a high enough bar. Like we know maternal mortality rates are still too high. And um, but beyond that, just surviving birth isn't a high enough bar. We have a right to not have further trauma inflicted on us during our perinatal care. 
And we have a right to dignity and autonomy, to culturally safe care, to be uplifted and cared for as sacred, as the life givers of our creation stories, not to be shamed and blamed for the way legacies of trauma are manifesting in our health. We have a right to be born in love, free of fear and shame and all that does not serve us to start our life surrounded by love and strength and in our own power. So that's our, our vision. <laughs> and why we do what we do. Um, we understand, you know, from like public health perspective, we know that the character taken during pregnancy and early childhood impact lifelong health for both the child and the birthing parent. Um, we see around the world that the well-being of the mother or the birthing person is the foundation for the well-being of the entire household, and it just ripples out from there to community. Pregnancy is an opportune time to work with families because a pregnant person is usually especially motivated and open to healing and positive health changes for the benefit of their of their child and themselves. Um, one of our, our great mentors, um, tribal doctor and traditional midwife, um, Rita Pitka Blumenstein advocates that we are ancestors. When we heal ourselves, we heal our ancestors, our grandmothers, grandfathers, and our children. When we heal ourselves, we heal mother earth. So just <clears throat> really thinking about how, um, that time during pregnancy birth is such an open time where we're connected to generations. And we know that um, like our, our understanding of time is, is cyclical. It's not like so linear that when we care for ourselves, um, even though we can't go back and change what's happened to our ancestors, we can still um, send love and healing um, and then pass that on to our future generations. I'll turn it back to Abra. Thanks, Mo. So um, everyone here knows this. We don't need to make the case for, um, for this, how important water is. What we know water is life. And um, when we're in our, when we're in the womb before we're born, we're surrounded by water. And we talk about connection to our sacred lands and waters. And we also know that indigenous populations across the US are disproportionately experiencing health disparities, maternal mortality rates, infant mortality rates. Um, Mo talked about the policy work that we're passionate about too, changing systems and changing policies. So um, I didn't, in my introduction, I didn't share, I'm on the maternal child death review in Alaska. And that's really important um, for me as well. But like when we talk about disparities, it's not that um, it's our fault. You know, it's that we're we've been let down. The system is not meeting our needs. It's not um, meeting us where we're at. So it also has to do with the way our environment and living conditions have been altered, and not um, the way they're, they're not safe for us and how we deserve them to be. And I'll also talk a little bit about um, how birth work is social justice work. And this, um, I don't know why it's a little blurry, but these two images here are from the Urban Indian Health Institute, Urban Indian Dictionary, and they talk about um, health equity and historical healing. So health equity recognizes that we have the answers to solve health disparities. They're carried in our stories, our land and our DNA. And when this knowledge is incorporated and valued, then we'll begin to achieve health equity. And historical healing is um, gathering the pieces broken by historical trauma, stitching them back together in bold, beautiful, intricate patterns of strength and resiliency. So we carry those legacies of harm. Um, that's what we're always told. You know, you've been harmed, the genocide, hurt, damage. But we also carry the um, historical strengths of our people. And we have that ability to heal. So we rely on that inherent ability to heal. And we know that we have that power for us and for Native people. And um, 
it's when we're entering birth work, it is social justice work, they're connected. We're responsible to our communities, not just to advocate, but to stand up for um, injustices and remind people how strong they are. And then a little bit about um, indigenous, and this is interesting too, because like we we work a lot on, oh, I love this picture. Mo, this is your baby, right? <laughs> One of one of your four babies out on the land um, gathering berries. So having that reciprocal relationship to the lands and waters you come from, and your family lineage or descendancy from a pre-colonial, pre-settler, indigenous society, being grounded in your indigenous culture and the language of where you are from, accepted and claimed by your indigenous community, and committed to the well-being of your indigenous people, community lands and waters you originate from and this is like an interesting thing too like um you know when we're, we're thinking about federal things because we're doing this with the um cdc in partnership with the cdc and and with ihs um it's whenever those terms are brought up and and alicia and i we met at the advisory committee on infant and maternal mortality um, so when we hear about AIAN and when people are talking, I'm doing a square, I'm doing a box because it's like we're put in this box of American Indian and Alaska Native, but we know that Indigenous people are all over the world. And so um, it's how people will self-identify as Indigenous and um, it, we don't fit into this AIAN box of Indigenous and um, like even in, you know, in Alaska, especially like we're so close to um, Canada and, and indigenous people there and that imaginary border is imaginary. So we still have ties like across borders and it doesn't just fit into like the United States term of of who is um, just an American Indian or an Alaska native because that, yeah, indigenous people are all over the world. So just so something to think about. And um, a brief overview of Indigenous people in Alaska. Alaska is really large, and I know some of you are, are zooming in from Alaska, so you know this. And I'm, a lot of you in the lower 48 probably have an understanding you might have visited here, but it's just kind of wild to wrap um, my mind around still being here, how big it is, because I did live in the lower 48. So, like, the Anupiak, um, the blue part, the North Slope is actually even smaller than just the blue part. Just the North Slope of Alaska is almost the size of the state of Wyoming. And um, the YK Delta is the size of the state of Oregon. And so those are just two regions in our, in our big state. And in Alaska, we have 229 recognized Alaska Native tribes over 20 indigenous languages. Okay, well, 20 indigenous languages are official state languages. There's more than that because there's um, more dialects and um, regional variations. And there's approximately 200,000 Alaska Native and American Indian, there's that term, people in Alaska who are eligible to receive care through our tribal healthcare system. 40% do live in the South Central region, which is Homer to Talkeetna. Um, and I'll share a little bit about our Alaska Native worldview. I love these images. So on the slide here, um, for anyone who cannot see I um, accessibility points, there's a or uh, there's an image. There's an artwork from a Payuk more or a bio, um, and it's so beautiful. It's a um, a parent with a baby in their belly and then a salmon. And then there's a, a picture of our Nikopiak or our traditional food. And there's an image of dancers in our hospital before the pandemic, people would gather in the middle and there's just, I don't, I can't tell 40 or more people dancing and drumming. So awareness of the interdependence of humanity with the environment, a reverence for and sense of responsibility for protecting the environment is part of our worldview. And that's from Oscar Coagli. And then Dr. Rita Pitka Blumenstein says, in order for a person to be whole, they must feed their mind, body, and spirit equally to heal themselves. So that's um, that wonderful healer, tribal doctor, and midwife, Dr. Rita Pitka Blumenstein. Um, and the next slide is just an example. Um, there's a 
PBS show many of you might have seen or heard of that we love here, um, Molly of Denali, and um, all Alaska Native people have traditional Alaska Native values. They're different from region to region, but um, it's just an example of, of many that are commonly found among different Alaska Native groups. So we show respect to each other. We share what we have. We know who we are. We accept what life brings. We're, we have patience, live carefully, take care of others, honor elders, and see connections. And remember that all things are related. And I will turn it over to Margaret for this next section. So this is a really dense slide attempting to summarize some of the structural impacts as we understand it for Alaska Native well-being, like different things that have happened um, over time that um, is affecting our health now. Um, so this image is of, is of a, a river, call it like a river of life. And on the bottom left is, um, where it kind of starts with, you know, first contact with people from outside of these lands. And <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get swept away. This is like, you know, lifelong learning or like at least a semester long class um, that we're just trying to summarize in a couple minutes. But um, I think it's really interesting how our health services, like Indian health services, um, you know, when treaties were were being made and that responsibility for providing health care for our peoples was first housed under the War Department. Um, I just, I think that's really interesting. Um, so, okay, I have to make my slide bigger so I can see. Um, in the uh, late 1800s, um, after Alaska, you know, became a territory, a U.S. territory, you know, missionaries started coming, and there was actually a meeting where, um, you know, missionaries looked at the map of the state of Alaska and divided it up, like, which church is going to go colonize, you know, which part of Alaska, and, um, you know, started boarding schools, and, just that legacy of um, kind of like taking over um, indigenous, like like education of our indigenous children and um, separating children from, from families. So that transmission of traditional knowledge. There were also um, great epidemics um, that swept through, you know, entire villages, um, leaving a generation of orphans. So just thinking about how that's like um, impacted that transmission of traditional knowledge and skills for that we've developed over millennia for thriving on this land and waters. Um, it wasn't until, some people don't realize that it wasn't until like 1924 that um, Native people were uh, recognized as citizens of this country, you know, the original peoples of these lands. Um, in 1955, the Indian Health Service was formed. And as we um, here, like all of us here understand, um, are charged with, you know, administering health care um, for um, a, a, I can't say the acronym right, AIAN. <laughs> um, in Alaska, so moving up the river, we have a really powerful um, legacy of, of community health aids that we're really proud of, that we have, you know, for in, our, in our tribal health system, um, People are identified, you know, by their tribal councils for serving as the first responder for their community. So they receive, you know, training um, to be able to be the healthcare provider for their community. And this really um, like great network of, of support um, for people providing, you know, care in their villages. And there's like regional hubs and tertiary hubs. <clears throat> um, land claims. Um, there's a lot more to that. Um, related to Indigenous reproductive health care, it wasn't even that long ago, you know, like um, in the 1970s, where it was estimated about a quarter 
of indigenous women were um, coerced or forced into sterilization or it being done, you know, a lot of sometimes without even their knowledge of it happening. Um, so that wasn't even that long ago, you know, this force, this legacy of forced sterilization, um, you know, our, 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 our parents, um, you know, this was happening too. So um, thinking about how that's impacted, um, you know, generations um, after that. Um, in 1978, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, where it was practicing our ceremonies and um, indigenous spirituality was decriminalized. So, you know, for a hundred years before that, um, it was um, illegal to practice our ceremonies and indigenous spirituality. So again, thinking about how that's impacted transmission of our traditional knowledge. Um, oops, boarding schools. Um, and then another highlight in our Alaska tribal health system is the formation of the um, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium when we you know, took um, control of managing and delivering our own health care in Alaska. So that's really a strength. And I know I didn't do that slide justice. There's a lot more that we can all learn on that. <laughs> um, a little bit more for understanding how colonialism and colonization um, has also impacted some of these things in Alaska. Um, as we understand it, um, one definition for colonialism is the historical and ongoing policy or practices of acquiring political control over another country or land, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it, pretty much. And then colonization is the process of devaluing and dehumanizing Indigenous people through both formal and informal methods in order to justify exploiting them on their homeland. So this is an image of um, some children at a boarding school and the sign on the wall in the back says, do not speak Eskimo. So, um, you know, that legacy of like, kill oh, the Indian, save the man. Hmm. Big topics, deep breaths. Um, I think this is a really interesting um, image too. Um, this is just from a search through the Alaska Digital Archives, there's a photo of a midwife um, on the left. It, the photo of the title, or the title of the photo is called Midwife at Work. And then the photo on the right, um, midwife training. So like our um, traditional midwives and traditional doctors kind of being retrained into this um, other kind of like healthcare system, which the next slide goes into a little bit more. Um, how colonization has shaped where we birth, relating it to um, birth now. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of our like natural helpers, our traditional midwives, our tribal doctors, um, people that were identified, you know, as children and trained, you know, throughout their whole life, knowledge passed down. Um, again, that's been developed over many generations of experience like living on these lands and waters and and how to thrive here so um that knowledge system um kind of being retrained into this um like non-native medical health care system um another thing that started happening are these like kind of Karen Lawford talks about, um, has really great papers written on hidden policies. And I think about that a lot with our evacuation policies. So births um, essentially are removed from villages, even normal healthy births. Um, there aren't options for planned births um, in our villages. <clears throat> um, and so, Who is the name of the person who wrote about hidden policies? Karen Lawford is a indigenous midwife and professor now at I think Ryerson University in Ottawa. <clears throat> 
So now many rural Alaskans cannot receive perinatal health care or birth with medical support in their communities. Hmm. Um, so thinking about how that's shaped our maternity care as our traditional roles and knowledge were like inferiorized with new models of healthcare um, being introduced. So those traditional roles and knowledge were, were not passed on. Um, pregnancy, birth, and postpartum care is, is routinely referred out of rural communities away from support systems, traditions, and cultural practices. There is a level of like the health aid training where, um, you know, prenatal care um, is part of that, um, but that's not available in all rural communities. <clears throat> so usually, um, as far as we understand it, usually most of the time rural people have to, you know, travel to attend their prenatal appointments and then are, um, you know, expected to go into town um, in their third trimester to wait for birth. <clears throat> And so kind of the hidden policy around that is like our insurance programs, um, like the threat is that if, you know, somebody doesn't get to town in time for birth and does give birth in their village and like a, there's an emergency and a, and a medevac is required, that insurance won't pay for it. So that's kind of what we mean by like hidden policies. Um, also thinking about how this impacts like economy in the villages when Alaska Native women are removed from their homes for extended periods of time for birth, you know, like months at a time at, at a time that they're um, gone from their jobs while in town waiting for birth. Okay. Aubrey's going to give a little bit more of an overview of our um, like system setup. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah, so Margaret talked like a lot about the history and like and the, how we lost a lot of knowledge and um, and our traditional knowledge. I love what you shared, Margaret, about well, it's hard, but like how that knowledge was like built for generations and generations. And then suddenly, like this is like more recent. Um, Alaska um, didn't become a state until recently like it's you know Alaska and Hawaii are the the newer states so and most rural Alaska Native people are birthing really far from home there's about 2,000 Alaska Native babies that are born each year healthy rural pregnant people are almost forced to leave their home weeks ahead of time before their estimated due date to await birth at the regional hub or not even the regional hub so like Utkiagavik has a regional hub, Mo a lot of people have to go all the way to Anchorage. Um, half of the births at ANMC are to people who live outside of the Anchorage service area further than 90 miles away. Medicaid insurance does not cover travel for a support person, um, except when the patient is a minor. And that's honestly, that might've changed. I feel like minors are hardly supported either. Or, or I guess if a, more, a minor needs someone to go with them. Okay, I see what it's saying. And there's um, also pre-maternal homes that people have to go to wait at. And I'll share a little bit about where Alaska Native people give birth. So this map shows um, Alaska on the left and then Alaska's overlaid on the lower 48, we call it, or I think you call it the contiguous states, <laughs> the United States. So we say lower 48 in Alaska. Um, and you could see how big the um the spread is like the islands the Aleutian chain goes all the way over to California and then southeast is all the way over so it's like basically like east coast to west coast um it's really 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 broad and those red lines are the flight paths that people have to take so Atka to Anchorage is 1,102 miles Metlakatla to Anchorage is 1,193 flight miles uh, some Alaskans have to travel further to give birth than the distance of Seattle to Tijuana, which is 1,066 flight miles. And we have these hubs with Kagovic, Nome, Bethel, Fairbanks, Kodiak, Sitka. We did have Dillingham 
and that one was closed. And the tertiary care center is Alaska Native Medical Center. A little bit more about where Alaska Native people give birth. Um, this graph shows a timeline of in the 90s where there were more births at regional tribal health facilities and less at Alaska Native Medical Centers for Native people here in the state. And now it has changed. So that switch over happened um, closer to the year 2000. And now most births are at Alaska Native Medical Center. So in Anchorage, um, and Anchorage is the biggest city in Alaska with over 300,000 people. And a lot of um, people who have to travel to Anchorage live in a village of maybe 200 or 400 people. And they're asked to leave their home um, really early because they have to fly. There's no roads. So this slide is a quick overview of, of birth as a rural person. We, I mentioned pre-maternal homes earlier. Um, there's images of a couple here. The purple one on the left, the purple house is in Utkeagovic, and that's where I lived. I, I operated the pre-maternal home. I did not come up with the name. I'm not sure who made up that name. I, it never made sense to me. I don't know if anyone is really pre-maternal, but um, I don't know. They Whoever made up the name. <laughs> I, um, you know, there's been pre-maternal homes for a long time in Alaska. So in Bethel and in Utkagovic, um, there's a lot of smaller villages. And so parents fly into these hub communities um, maybe at 34, 35 weeks, and they're leaving their home communities. And again, there's no roads between most of these villages. So they're taking a small plane. They're asked to leave their family behind. They're leaving their sisters, their aunties, their grandmothers, their children, their spouses, and they're alone. Um, so the pre-maternal home where I, that I managed in Utkagovic for Arctic Slope Native Association had five beds, five, five bedrooms. There were bunk beds in some of the rooms. Um, and the one in Bethel, I think is bigger. And then folks get on a plane, a bigger plane and go to Alaska Native Medical Center, like in Anchorage, the big city. Um, and the next slide here, birth for Alaska Native people is almost always in a hospital setting, usually away from their own community traditions and practices, and evacuation is often mandatory for rural pregnant people, unless they're able to, um, so some people can stay in the hub communities, um, and that's, those births have been decreasing as well, so there's we we have we hope a lot of people express the desire to stay home and give birth, but they're told that they um, might not have a proven pelvis, like if it's their first baby, or they might have um, risks that deem them high risk. So even though we know we hear from our community, people want to be home, we know that that's like what they desire. They are often asked or. Um, yeah, I would, like Margaret shared, there's like fear tactics that happen to um, kind of like pressure people into leaving their homes. And um, we know that people are more supported, cared for, and feel better when they're surrounded by their family. And this is often just not an option. So that is really a big reason that we started Alaska Native Birth Workers Community. We know that people are alone and they need support and they need culturally matched care. It's gonna like help when there's other Alaska Native people there. I'll share quickly um, that, well, maybe I'll click to the next slide. This is um, a little bit about what we can do to support Alaska Native birthing families. Um, we can become familiar with their cultures and histories, become familiar with their structural impacts, with structural impacts and utilize trauma-informed and healing-centered care, and tradition does best practices, community-based solutions, and cultural safety. So when we talk about culturally matched care, it's um, our definition is someone from <laughs> your own culture there, like, or someone that, that knows and supports your cultures and values and can uplift and honor those. So a lot of times in Anchorage, at, or even in the hub communities at those hospitals, there aren't other native people providing care and it can feel really isolating and alone. And what I didn't expect when I started um, attending births, I've been a doula for over 12 years now. 
but really full time with ANBC going to births regularly for the past two years. And it's been incredible. It's been really healing for me. But what has been amazing is um, twice I met family members I had never met before. And then two other times I got a call from the labor and delivery unit. And it was um, a nurse asking for support from someone who was alone. And when I got there, it was someone I knew from Utkagovic from my home community. And they were people that I'd known for years and um, had connections to, and they knew me. So and I feel like in some ways it was more healing for me as their doula. I mean, I'm sure they were grateful that I was there, but it was so special to know that that person who was alone was no longer alone and they had another Anupiak person with them and I was there to support them and it was just yeah that was really um an unexpected amazing thing that that happened out of um out of what we're doing with this community-based approach so um I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Margaret for the last few slides. We're getting towards the end and we're doing good, I think, on time too. So thanks for listening. Mo, you're on. Sure, yeah, this is just another resource for a great class um, about more of this and on cultural safety. There's an online course through Frontier Nursing University it's free. There's three CEUs, um, and it was developed by an Ojibwe uh, midwife during day, and then uh, a nurse midwife, Erin um, Tenney. Um, so I recommend that. Um, and then next slide. She just kind of say he did not have a stroke. Um, so again, um, yeah, like our, just kind of thinking about um, some questions to consider. Again, we're not wanting to speak beha on behalf of rural birthing people in Alaska or, or like advocate for any like specific solutions. We're just trying to understand like how we got to like where we are now and then building on the, um, you know, tremendous work that our tribal health leaders have done to advocate for us like building upon that to consider questions about like who decides our our birth options how does this impact um how does the way we birth impact maternal child family and community health and what do these choices mean for growing families i just think about how like we're kind of like in the system where it's pretty normalized now that birth is a medical event rather than a family event you know forever it's been a family event that everybody had household knowledge to know how to support somebody during this phase of life you know a lot of times you know my a lot of our grandparents, including my grandma, was born out on the trap line and her dad um, caught the baby. So there was like household knowledge and she was premature and they knew how to take care of her. And she lived like well into her 90s. So like there was household knowledge for, um, again, like as we've been talking about for, you know, how we've learned to thrive on these lands and waters over millennia, that traditional knowledge that was pass passed on and household knowledge for how to care for each other, how to prevent, you know, all these like health complications that are happening to us now um, to support healthy pregnancy and birth, um, how that knowledge is like getting disconnected. And we kind of rely on this like medical healthcare system where it's, it's really both together. We have like community and family responsibility and individual responsibility for like taking care of ourselves. Um, not just relying on kind of like this medical model to carry us through. Cause it's not enough. We need both we need the medical you know like interventions when there's complications but for the most part birth is a normal healthy like family event and it's such an important like rites of passage it's such a turning point in our life where 
we can be empowered um, for in you know starting our family and for the rest of our lifelong health, or we can be traumatized and further like um, perpetuate these like cycles of harm. So I just that's why we're really passionate about this work and why we're here doing what we do and um, just wanting to have community conversation for what other people like in our community think about this. <clears throat> the last slide that we want to end on um, are images and I, I, I saw um, Ursula Noki Wilson on earlier. This picture on the top right is um, from uh, she's a Diné midwife um, mentor in our community, and um, that's a picture um, at Chinle um, where she worked and helped get a birthing sash and um, our sash belt installed to help um, with birth. The picture in the middle is a midwife sister attending a birth um, in a traditional setting, and then the, I'm going from like top. Um, the top row and going kind of backwards right to left. Um, and then the picture on the top left are um, Inuit midwives. Again, really great example and resources from Inuit midwiferies that were started by the community midwiferies, meaning like birth centers. Um, you know, thinking about those evacuation policies, there was a parent, a pregnant parent that refused to get on the plane and said, we're going to train our own Inuit midwives and start our own Inuit birth centers for our babies to be born in our language within our community. Um, just really powerful. Lots of good like papers on like positive health outcomes from those birth centers. Um, anyway, just thinking about rematriation, returning the sacred to the mother, um, thinking about rematriation as Indigenous women led or birthing person led um, work to restore sacred relationships between Indigenous people and our ancestral lands, honoring our matrilineal societies, um, and really thinking about re centering and having Indigenous birth being led by Indigenous birthing people. Hmm. And Zinkala there too. Hmm. What's that? Mm -hmm. Oh, Zinkala too. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So just different examples of taking birth back in our communities. Hmm. Beautiful. Hmm. And this is our connection slide. Connect with us. We can probably copy and paste these in the chat too. Yeah. Uh, but don't go everyone, because we're going to have breakouts. So <laughs> I can turn it back over to Alicia. I'll just keep this up for a minute so people can mark this down and I'll um, try to pull a copy and chat or, or just type in our website and our email. Yeah, don't, yeah. Um, with the break, word breakout sessions, please don't feel free. Like you have to leave. Um, but really, like we said, we're just creating a space. But first off, I really um, just thank you, Avra and Margaret, um, for your beautiful presentation and in-depth information. I think it's really important that we um, highlight the historical context, specifically with Alaska Native communities, um, very different, obviously, from what we see um, in the U.S. slash uh, lower 48, um, in a different terms when it comes to speaking on Native people, Native women, American Indian, Alaska Native, Indigenous terms, so, um, and just the historical trauma context as well, you know, just where all these, it's not one day we just came up with um, facing a lot of disparities and inequities, um, and I definitely agree with the systems not meeting where a lot of us are. Um, so now moving into our breakout sessions and what we have, let's see this slide. Perfect. Okay, so let me just go over this because I'm not sure if everyone has experience working with Jamboard, Google, which is fine. It's not a complicated system, thankfully. So, and I'll continue to hopefully make everyone feel confident in using this platform. So um, it's Google Jamboard and I just put it in the chat box and I'll be sharing my screen to kind of just show you some of the quick functions of how to use it. Um, 
So everyone will be automatically assigned to a breakout room. Every breakout room will be answering the same questions that are located on this Google Jamboard, where you can type up your answers or just speak freely. And maybe you don't want to uh, jot down your answers, but everything will be anonymous. Um, there are four total questions available. And maybe you won't get through all the questions and that's okay. Or maybe you want to talk about different questions that come up in your group, which is totally fine too. And we just want to give you that freedom to discuss your own questions or um, conversations that will come up. Um, and just overall space to connect, learn and hear from one another, um, sharing your knowledge, whether it's at the um, tribal or non-tribal and community levels or what organizations um, and the work that you're doing and just taking, taking this time to engage with others in the field of maternal and child health. Um, so I think that's it. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So bear with me. So many tabs. Hopefully, you guys don't see all my tabs. <laughs> but um, so everyone will be assigned to different breakout rooms, about 10 to 12 people each room. And if you see my mouse right here, so you'll just double check what breakout room you're at. So this is breakout room one. And if you go into these arrows right here, you know, switching through the different breakout rooms. Um, and yeah, so these are the different questions and just having a space right here to feel free to share any resources. I kind of just left the um, note tabs to double click and then pretty much leave your question here so, and then save it. Whether you want to make it bigger or smaller, um, you can do that and then you'll locate the sticky notes here to create a new one if you want or the text box in this highlight red, which you can change the colors here. So mostly just got to point yourself to the sticky note function or the text box and just making sure which breakout room um, you're at. And I think that's it. Um, but if you guys have any trouble, um, just let me know. So let me stop sharing. And then right now I'm going to create these breakout rooms and it's going to say, you know, Alicia, I put you in a room. So you'll just press join. So let's see if this works. <laughs> okay, let's go. Okay, so there'll be about 10 breakout rooms, which about 10 to 11 people. So let's see how this goes. And we'll just hop around me and Liv um, and just see where the conversations are or help facilitate these conversations and presenters feel free and our CDC partners can will also be joining us. So we just encourage everyone to take this time to learn and hear more from each other. Um, so let me go ahead and create those. So it should be popping up now. And you'll just accept those invitations to those breakout rooms. And open all rooms. So yeah, now you should be joining, my bad. <laughs> I see it. Awesome. Thanks, Alicia. And then how, we're in there for 10 minutes. Yes. Sorry, everyone. 10 minutes. And I'll put that in the all broadcast right now when we should be back. Um, Can you, can you tell me what breakout room I was in? Oh, I see it. Breakout room 10. Thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. Spoke so specific with my broadcast. Got it. And Gabrielle, as you just joined, if you missed kind of the instructions on what we're doing. We're happy to, oh, I think they got it. Okay. Okay. Everyone else should be in the room, which is fine if not. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna <laughs> pop into a room, Alicia, but let me okay. know. I'm gonna to pause the recording. And people, enjoyable. So, and I've been just scrolling through the different pages of Post-it. So I'm really happy to see everyone being engaged with each other and um, just sharing what you're doing and yeah, part participating in this exercise. So thank you. Um, did anyone want to share out what their group was speaking on or discussing or something that you shared? And I'll um, give you guys space to, if anyone wants to share.
Hi, Alicia. I'm Judy Parker from Oklahoma. And I just wanted to share that our group mentioned uh, the slide that had the river on it, that had the timeline of events from, you know, early uh, maybe European contact and what happened with health policy and when Indian Health Service came into, um, into effect in 1955. We just thought that was a really interesting slide. Thanks. Thank you, Judy, so much for sharing. Okay. I will... Hi, this is, uh, this is Dietrich. Ahead. My name is Dietrich Apps. I'm located in Durham, North Carolina. I'm part of the Maternal Health Learning Innovation Center, one of the partners through Race for Equity. And I, um, I was very grateful to see the map that you shared that showed the overlaid on the United States of the in the uh, lower 48 <laughs> um, that showed the difference um, and the scale of how far people who are giving birth have to travel and how long they are away from their families. That is the first time that I have heard or understood that. And so that is very valuable information to set context to um, for the impact that that has, not only on that person, but also on their families and their community for so many people to be taken away uh, at such a critical time. So thank you for sharing that and the graphic. Yes, thank you, Avra and Margaret. Um, I'm going to move forward with time right now. And if we need Margaret and Abra, we'll also share the contact information on that post webinar email. Um, and also I'll move forward with highlighting our maternal health resources now. If I can find my slides. Okay. Let's see. And let me drop some links to, we definitely wanna take the time to highlight our the different return of health resources. As we said, this tribal learning community series is in partnership with our CDC. And right now we'll be speaking on the Hear Her campaign. So um, we'll drop the link soon if they haven't done that already. Um, but the resources on this page, the cdc.gov hear her slash AIAN has been developed for American Indian Alaska Native people who are pregnant or postpartum, their support networks and healthcare professionals who serve them. Um, so this is the hub for all information and resources. And if you haven't checked out any of the videos located on the site, I really do encourage you to check out um, the page to hear more experiences coming from American Indian birthing people. And, you know, it not only speaks on their pregnancy related complications, but also highlights their strengths, uh, protective factors and resilience overall. And on the next slide, the, they also include conversation guides um, part, as part of the many resources located on this hub um, on the site. And with these conversation guides, it, different documents highlight and recognize the urgent maternal warning signs and encourage getting care. Um, and overall will work to save lives. And so it's important to learn the various urgent maternal warning signs. And we all have a role to play to um, strengthen, strengthen our support system, whether it's our own families, our community, our workplaces. Um, so, and pregnancy complications can happen up to a year after birth. So this document highlights those signs and includes examples on how to initiate um, these type of conversations with birthing people or postpartum people. And lastly, with, um, well, not, this on the last slide, with the uh, palm cards, you can access these palm cards and posters as well. Um, they are available in print and can be ordered at no cost. I will have the contact information for Sarah, Sarah Kerrigan if anyone had questions. Um, if we can move to the last slide, Liv, on the next one. That, um, in addition, these resources are available to be co-branded with tribal seals or your, the health department logos that you're coming from um, through the CDC state and local media center. And if you wanna, you guys will have these slides, but if you wanna take a picture for more information on how to order or utilize the different hear her resources for your community or organization, then um, these are the two emails that you can get in touch with. And I apologize for the different links um, in the small font, but at our next call, we will highlight these resources more in depth as um, in our next webinar in April, which will include the current model for tribally led 
maternal mortality review committees and taking the time on why it's important to have tribal representation on these review boards and exploring the feasibility of developing and sustaining a tribally led MMRC. Um, and we'll also be including these links and resources at the in our webinar. But that concludes overall our first part one of our maternal health tribal learning community series. Again, just really appreciate our speakers here today sharing the amazing resources and the work that they're doing in Alaska. And thank you everyone for engaging in our exercise and just sticking with us to the end. So I wish everyone a great day and please take care of yourself and stay safe. So thank you everyone.